Hello, friends, here on 3BN Sabbath School panel. We are about the truth, the truth of God's Word, and that's what we do each and every week as we study the Word of God in spirit and in truth. We worship the Lord as we rightly divide His Word of truth, and we're making our way through a study of the book of Isaiah. This week, we're on lesson number eight, entitled, Comfort My People. And uh, you know what? You may be new to 3AB and Sabbath School panel. We want to make sure that you have a copy of the lessons so that you can be able to study with us. So there's two ways you can do that. Of course, we encourage you to go to your local Seventh-day Adventist church because there they can provide a free free copy of the lesson, and you have a small group to study with, or you can go to www.absg.adventist.org, and you can access a digital copy of the lesson. You can put it on your iPad, your phone, your computer, and you can study right along with us. So again, this week, we're excited about what we're going to be studying. We don't want you to go anywhere because we're going to come back in just a moment, and we're going to continue through our study this week. Hello, friends, and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're making our way through the book of Isaiah, and we have made it to lesson number eight. I think we can say we're a little over halfway there. What do you guys say? Amen. 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 All right, and it's been a wonderful study. I've really learned a lot from the book of Isaiah, even though I've read through and I've, I've studied the book of Isaiah over the years. There's always something else that the Lord will yeah. show you along the way, and it helps that you sit on an incredible panel full of experts. Uh, and, and it's a blessing to be with each one of you guys. Let me introduce our panel. We have Miss Shelley Quinn. It's a blessing to have you. Wonderful to be here. Praise the Lord. And then Pastor John Lomagay. It's always a blessing to have you, brother. Yeah, Isaiah has been an eye-opener and a reminder. Praise Amen. God for it. Amen. Then to your left, we have Sister... S I almost called you Shelley, but you're not Shelley. You're Jill Morricone. All right. How are you, Jill? Doing well. We're getting into my favorite part of Isaiah, starting with chapter 40. I love this part. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful chapter. Mm -hmm. And Brother Kenny Shelton, you're locked and loaded and ready to go, brother? I'm just praising the Lord for the opportunity and privilege. That's right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lesson number eight this week is entitled, Comfort My People. And a little bit different from some of the previous lessons where we've all kind of had, uh, uh, you know, different chapters, you know, taking on multiple chapters. We all get to kind of, you know, take a piece of this pie of chapter 40 as we're studying uh, that particular chapter in this lesson this week. Uh, before we go any further, we need to have a prayer. And Pastor Luma King, why don't you uh, say a prayer for us, brother? Sure. Our loving Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege of your word. Truly, it is a lamp to our feet and a light mm. to our paths. Illuminate our minds, Lord, that we may communicate light and truth. Amen. But may all the glory and honor go only to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9 is our memory text for this week's lesson. And uh, again, it says, Get up into the high mountain, <laughs> well. O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold mm -hmm. your God. Mm -hmm. So that's our memory text. And uh, I want to open Sabbath afternoon had a wonderful story that kind of sets the foundation or sets us up for Sunday's lesson, which is entitled Comfort for the Future. Uh, but this story says here, it says World War II ended in 1945 while a Japanese soldier named Shoichi Yokoi well. was hiding out in the jungle on the island of Guam. Mm -hmm. Leaflets dropped from the U.S. planes pro proclaimed peace, of course, but Yo Yokoi thought it a trick. So he didn't really believe that, you know, he thought it was a trick. He thought the mm -hmm. war was ongoing. A loyal patriotic soldier of the emperor, he had vowed never to surrender because he had no contact with civilization. He lived on what he could find in the jungle, a sparse, hard existence indeed. Mm -hmm. In 1972, 27 years after the end <laughs> of World War II, hunters came across Yokoi while he was fishing. And he only learned then that the message of peace had been true. 27 years after the war. What a life. 
While the rest of his people had been enjoying peace for decades, Yokoi had been enduring decades of privation and stress. Mm. Mm. And you know, that can be said for a lot of us, yep, for a lot yeah. of people. There may be someone watching today that mm. says, you know what, I've just, seems like my life has just been full of anxieties and stress and mm -hmm. depressions and whatever it is that you may be dealing with, but the Lord has a message. He wants yeah. to bring comfort. He wants yeah. us to have peace. And that's what Sunday's lesson is all about, entitled Comfort for the Future. Of course, this is in the context of Judah, the, the nation of Israel at that time, the remnant of the Lord, who had been through a lot up to this point. Mm -hmm. And our verses that kind of set the foundation for what we're going to be studying here this week from Isaiah 40. I'm going to start in verses 1 and 2, and this is what it says. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, mm -hmm. that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Mm -hmm. And so this is an interesting text because what we're about to find out in studying my, my lesson for this week and Sunday is kind of helping to set the foundation in understanding how to rightly divide these chapters. And we, we've arrived kind of to a turning point in the scripture in which all the way up to this point, you know, in, in referencing Isaiah chapters 1 through 39, which we've studied so far, uh, it emphasizes events that are leading up to the deliverance from the Assyrians, which of course happened in 701 B.C., uh, but of course, at the beginning of chapter 40, as the lesson brings out, and I have to agree with it, based on the, on the language that we're about to study, uh, the book kind of leaps ahead about a century and a half to the end of the Babylonian captivity, where Jerusalem found themselves in 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Verse 40 carries us beyond to the end of that captivity to 539 B.C., of course, when they're uh, being delivered by Cyrus. Cyrus makes a decree, sends the people home, and of course, uh, the, the Jews return shortly thereafter. So verse, verses 1 and 2 in, in chapter 40 of Isaiah is within the context. When we're talking about comfort my people, it's not coming necessarily on the brink of the ending of the you know, oppression that Assyrians were placing upon Israel, but rather skipping forward to the time after the Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice there, in the, in, we, can set, we can clearly prove this through uh, the language of the text. You'll notice here in verses 1 and 2 where it says... Uh, you know, comfort for Jerusalem and cry out for her that her warfare is ended, okay, that her iniquity is pardoned, mm. for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And the lesson just simply brings out and asks the question, what, what sins? What, what punishment did she have to endure? What is this speaking of, this, this overcoming that God has brought them through, this endurance that they've had to endure, what is it speaking of? And so basically we know that uh, there was punishment administered by Assyria. Of course, Isaiah chapter 10 refers to it as the rod of God's anger. He allowed that judgment to come upon Israel because of their lack of commitment to the covenant uh, uh, that he had made with them. And so from which God delivered Judah by destroying Sennacherib, which we studied in the previous lessons. And of course, as I said earlier, that happened in 701 BC. And you can read about that in Isaiah chapter 37, which we studied last week. Um, of course, and there was also the punishment administered by other nations mm -hmm. against which Isaiah uh, had given proclamations against these individual nations. And you can read that from Isaiah 14 all the way through to chapter 23. And so you go and read, you know, chapters 1 through 39, and that takes you all the way up to the time in which God delivered his people from the Assyrian armies. Mm -hmm. But if you jump right into chapter 40, it almost seems like it, it's talking about God's finally going to bring comfort and peace to the people after he delivered them from, you know, from Sennacherib and from what had happened with the Assyrian oppression. But yet the language suggests, if you go back and kind of put some pieces together, that actually, you know, we've skipped ahead about a century and a half. Mm -hmm. And God is speaking of a time in which Israel would come out of oppression. They would come out of that captivity in Babylon. And only at that point would God say, okay, now you can endure a time of peace. You can, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to bring comfort to my people. So that brings me to the point here where I say the, there was judgment administered by Babylon, okay? Mm -hmm. Which even though up to this point, the text has not really expounded on that and we haven't been brought up to that historical point yet. Uh, this is where Babylon comes in. The punishment that was administered by Babylon, which would carry away goods and people from Judah because for two reasons, and I'm going to read a little bit of one reason, but we read one last week. We studied one of the reasons why uh, Israel would be carried away to Babylon because Hezekiah made a mistake. Mm. He had 
forgotten what God had done for him. And so he, of course, displayed his wealth to the messengers of those people that had come from Babylon. And we read that from Isaiah chapter 39 last week. And I agree with you, Jill, what you had said last week. We wish that you know, the, the message of Scripture in Isaiah uh, as far as, you know, the, the oppression and all that had happened would have stopped with chapter 38, but, mm. you know, we, there's chapter 39. And so it tells the story of something right. that is to come for the nation of Israel as they would have to endure, uh, you know, again, more captivity, more oppression, more time of, of havoc because of their own sins mm. and because of the sins of the leadership. In fact, I want to read about that right now just to kind of set the context. Mm. This is, uh, let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 30. Because I said there was two reasons why they would have to endure this Babylonian captivity. One was based on the part of Hezekiah's bad decision to do what he done and not recognizing who the Lord was and not giving credit where credit is due. Yeah. Uh, he became, you know, obviously selfish and was talking about all that he was doing and all that the nation mm -hmm. of Israel had done to gain all this wealth. But God has a different message also for a second reason as to why they would be carried off into Babylonian captivity. This is set found in 2 Chronicles 36. And we're going to read verses 14 through 21. Starting with verse 14, it says, Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more mm -hmm. according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. So again, this is after Hezekiah. Hezekiah did point the people to God. He did allow them to worship the Lord. And he was, as the Bible said, he did right in the sight of the Lord for the most part. But after him, there was a slew, a string of kings that did horrible things and launched Israel into pagan worship, into you know, worshiping sun gods and, and completely defiling the house of the Lord. And that's what we're seeing here in record. It goes on to say in verse 15, And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers. Of course, we know this to be the prophet. Mm -hmm. rising up early and sending them. Why? Because he had compassion on yeah. his people. Even amongst all this apostasy, God had compassion yeah. on his people and on his dwelling place. Verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets mm -hmm. until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Um, and so what was the response to that? Let's read in verse 17 and onward. It says, Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin on the age of the weak. He gave them all into his hand and all the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king of the leaders. All these he took to Babylon. So those treasures that Hezekiah was all, you know, bragging about, look, look, yeah. look what I've done, look what I have here. Babylon came back yeah. for it yeah. as a judgment on Israel. Verse 19, then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all of its palaces with fire and destroyed all of its precious possessions. And those who escaped the sword he carried away to Babylon where they became servants to him and his sons and to the rule of the king of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah mm. until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Of course, this is speaking of the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. We say all of this because I'm not going to go into it because we don't have enough time. But if you go back and read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, there's language connecting this passage to the first two verses of Isaiah 40 that we just read earlier, where God says, comfort my people. Right. Tell them that because of all of this, you know what, I've forgiven them. I've pardoned them. Now I'm going to allow them to endure a time of peace. So you'll see here, if you go read Isaiah 14, verses 1 through 4, and I'll just read verse 3 here. It says, yeah. it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow. There it is. Mm. And from your fear and the hard bondage of which you have made, you were made to serve, <laughs> that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how the oppressed has ceased, the golden city ceased. So again, that language is the, almost the exact same language in context what we find in Isaiah 40 verses 1 and 2 when God says, you know what, it's a, I'm giving you a time of peace. All those, all those hardships and all of the, the, the hard things you've had to endure because of your decisions, you have paid for those sins. You have paid, you have done your time, okay? You've spent your time in prison. Now I'm going to have compassion on you once more and I'm going to allow you to endure and have a time of peace. Praise God for that. Don't we need peace in our lives? 
life? Amen. Shouldn't we be able to also glean from this that we need to trust in the promises of God's Word? That right now, yes. many of us may be dealing with hardships in our life. We may be dealing with stresses and anxiety, yes. but God is for His people. He says, <laughs> hang in there. Amen. Trust in my promises because I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to give you a never-ending time Ooh. of peace. Yeah, that's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that. Whoops. Um, my lesson assignment is Monday and it is called God's presence or it says presence, word, and road work. So let me just, I'm going to get to the chase, uh, cut to the chase here. Mm -hmm. God's presence and God's word are covenant mm. promises. They were, give, God's presence, God's word was delivered to the people at Mount Sinai. But guess what? They were rejected it. They rejected mm. his word. They rejected him all throughout their apostasy. So sin had broken this covenant mm. between God and his people. And the road work we're going to see mm. is repentance. Mm. It is a turning away from sin in order to mm -hmm. receive yeah. the comfort of God's forgiveness and peace. So once again, Isaiah 40 verse word mm -hmm. one, verse one. Comfort, yes, comfort mm -hmm. my people, says your God. So Isaiah is instructed to prophesy as though mm -hmm. the Babylonian captivity were already a present reality. And you know, this is a dramatic shift. Instead of proclaiming the judgment and the doom, he's talking about the exile that's still a hundred years in the future before Jerusalem's fall, then they were going to spend mm -hmm. 70 years Amen. in captivity. But Isaiah, God says, speak to my people tenderly, bring words of comfort to them, mm -hmm. a hope of a blessed yeah. future. Mm -hmm. So we always have to remember that God yes. has a plan for mm -hmm. his covenant That's people. Right. Right. So verse two, he says, speak comfort to Jerusalem, cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of oh. her sins. Now, the cruel assault and the captivity of the Babylonians was the double payment. And that mean that all of their sins, and, and it's so amazing how God would rescue his people, they'd turn away from him. God would rescue yeah, his yeah. people, they'd turn That's away right. from him. Right. I think that happens too much today as well. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what this reminds me of? Here's God, he's, he's anticipating their questions and He's giving them hope for a future. That's good. It reminds me of Isaiah 65, 24, before mm. they call, I will answer. Yeah. So God is prophesying through Isaiah before it ever happens mm. so that the people will know in advance that they have reason for hope. And actually, this is not just the deliverance from Babylonian captivity mm. or, or by Cyrus. It's also the future yeah. deliverance from the future system of Babylon that we read about in Revelation because the ultimate fulfillment we're going to see is the ultimate fulfillment of this deliverance comes in Jesus Christ. Mm. So verse 3, Isaiah 40, verse 3, mm. the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Oh. So here's an unnamed herald. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. Then crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places made smooth. Mm. You know, it was customary for Eastern monarchs, they would send their uh, heralds out before them to clear the pass, oh, yeah. to, to make it a level road for them. Yeah. But we know that this prophecy is not speaking of the physical realm because if you look at Israel <laughs> in the wilderness and their deep wadis and their high mountains, Boy, I mean, you'd have to have a bulldozer and dynamite. It'd still be a daunting task, wouldn't it? Uh -huh. So he's speaking of the spiritual realm. And actually, Isaiah 42, verse 16 tells us, 
Only God can achieve this, this mm -hmm. true road yes. work. Listen to yes. what he says. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths mm -hmm. they have not known. I will make darkness light before them mm -hmm. and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them yes. and not forsake them. So God is the one, as I believe it's Acts 532 that says he grants us repentance through Jesus Christ. But what God was telling his people is watch for my restoration. You're gonna, there's going to come a day mm -hmm. that you will repent. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament explicitly applies this to repentance. So let's look at that. John the Baptist, Matthew well, 3, 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. He's the, I think of him as the last Old Testament prophet, even though he doesn't show up till the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one that is preparing the way, he's the ordained forerunner for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So he challenges the people through repentance. Matthew 3, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judah and saying, repent. Mm -hmm. That's right. I can hear that echoing. Oh boy. Can oh you boy. not? Yes. From all those years back when he said this, mm -hmm. I hear that echo. And I hope that resonates with your heart. Amen. That God is always calling us to repentance. And, right. it, and we need to say, Lord, not mm -hmm. only am I confessing my sins, but mm -hmm. grant me repentance. Turn me right. around. Mm -hmm. Turn yeah. me away from this sin, Lord. Okay. So. Matthew 3, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at, is at hand. And then verse 3 says, this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So that's the road work. Um, the remnant of Israel. It says in Mark 1 that John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. This is the only way that he could get their attention and prepare mm -hmm. their hearts, clearing the way for, uh, and, and you know, I think of confession Whoa. as the clearing house of the conscience. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, when, when you are feeling guilty, just go before the Lord well. and confess your sin. And you know what? He takes all that guilt and mm -hmm. condemnation away from you. And you know that when you confess your sin, he's faithful and just. Mm -hmm. First John all 1, right. 9 says to cleanse. I mean, not only to forgive you, but to cleanse mm -hmm. you of all yeah. unrighteousness. Right. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So what happens, verse 5 of Isaiah 40, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. Mm -hmm. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So this prophecy is looking beyond their punishment. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's looking to the return of God's yes. glory when he would bring them comfort and deliverance and hope yes. and their misery, God's going to wipe <laughs> it away and his glory is going right. to replace it. So um, what happens is they're going to receive the favor that they rejected mm -hmm. for all those years. Isn't that amazing? So his presence and his word would be restored. Isaiah 40, verse 6, another voice proclaims. This voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? <laughs> all flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely yeah. the people are grass. But, and then it says, I love verse eight. The grass withers, the foul flower mm. fades, but the word of our Lord stands mm. forever. Yes. We are like the flower and the mm. grass, short-lived. Mm -hmm. We right. fade, we're here today and mm. gone tomorrow. Yeah. You know, humanity is mortal. In 2 Timothy, or, yeah, 1 Timothy 6, 16, Paul explains right now only God is immortal. We, right. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 53, 54 tells us that 
We don't put on immortality until the last trumpet when Christ returns. So mm -hmm. we're just grass, but God's word is permanent mm -hmm. and it guarantees that there'll be no deviation mm -hmm. from his plan. The eternal mm -hmm. word is dependable. It brings comfort, mm -hmm. encouragement, even in the face of adversity. Mm -hmm. I just want to encourage you. Mm -hmm. God wrote this word to give you a hope for the future. Amen. Get into the Bible today. Ask for God's presence and his word to be restored in your life. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All I love right. that. Praise the Lord for forgiveness, right? Amen. Amen. I love that, that scripture in Acts that you quoted. I think it's Acts 531, mm -hmm. which says, you know, God has given us Christ so that we might have forgiveness That's of sins. Amazing. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back in a moment. Amen. Yeah, man. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back, friends, to 3AB and Sabbath School panel. We're going to toss it over to Pastor John Loma King for Tuesday's lesson. Mm -hmm. I like the title of Tuesday, The Birth of Evangelism. Yeah. The birth of evangelism. Would God be so kind to give me that title? There you go. The birth of evangelism. You know, when we read Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 to 11, I like to begin there. And the writer, I love the transition, Jill. We're, we're now starting to get into the, the lighter side of Isaiah, mm. the, the side which, which has uh, chapters and prophecies that bring brighter news. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw the carnage and the, and the military exploits and the wars and, and just a number of, I would say, depressing pictures. Mm -hmm. But the good news out of all of that depression is that God still, still sustains his people. That's right. He's still the one that's in charge of the outcome of the story. Yeah. So we have all that bad news behind us. And the Lord now through the prophet Isaiah starts to forecast the perpetuity of good news. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 9 to 11. We'll begin there. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountains, O Jerusalem. That's the place of proclamation where the message can resonate over the hillsides. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice mm. with strength. Sound the three angels' messages with a loud voice. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Mm. Verse 10, behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. Revelation 22, verse 12, yeah. so much in there. Yeah. And his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. John chapter 10. All this imagery is in there. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, the lost sheep, and gently lead those who are with, who are with young. Mm -hmm. Just so much imagery in that passage mm -hmm. that we begin to find that Isaiah the prophet, what I love about the Bible, uh, which is showing the deep inspiration of it, is what's forecasted 700 years before starts to be metered into the lives of the writers of the New Testament, which shows that there's no way, they were not even around. Mm. And these records were not uh, freely proliferated among them. So God, the same inspiration that spoke to Isaiah the prophet and Ezekiel and Jeremiah mm. is the same one that begins to inspire the minds of those who begin to lay the foundation of evangelism. Mm. And I find also when we talk about the mission of Christ, because clearly the ultimate evangelist is Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I want to just make a few points about evangelism because the mission of Christ is being revealed in these two verses. Mm -hmm. But there are those who are forerunners of Christ mm -hmm. that are also going to be revealed. We'll talk about that in a moment. But four very quick points about the mission of Jesus uh, that is foretold in the verses. Uh, Jesus-based evangelism. 
there should be no other kind of evangelism. Amen. Uh, yes. You know, evangelists, we could, we know, I mean, those of us who love studying mm. Revelation, we all love the deep, the depth of the book. But sometimes we can get so locked into the imagery mm -hmm. That's right. yeah. that we forget it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Yeah. And people are not going to be converted on the, on the veracity of the viciousness of a beast, <laughs> but they will be converted on the goodness of God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And the beautiful news of Revelation is Jesus-based evangelism is not based on information, but it's focused on transformation. Yeah. So that's what the prophet is mm. talking about here. Jesus-centered evangelism is not new thought, mm -hmm. but a new life. Amen. Amen. The focus never needs to be changed. Jesus-driven evangelism is not aimed at membership, mm -hmm. but discipleship. Yes. Members, I've said so many, you can do whatever you want as a member, but you can't do whatever you want as a disciple <laughs> because oh. it requires denial of oneself. So you might think about, well, what does it take? And people have asked me, what does it take to be a member of your church? I've changed my answer. I said, I don't want members. <laughs> I want disciples. Amen. Because the Lord never said, go therefore to make members yeah, of amen. all nations. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all yeah. nations. That's right. We've got too much membership and not enough discipleship. Yeah. Can I touch you? We just broke our COVID-19. Oh, yeah, but that's, that's too good. good. <laughs> we got too much members and not enough disciples. Yes. That's a really so Jesus-based evangelism is go make disciples. Amen. Stop settling for membership. Amen. Membership dries up the pews. Mm -hmm. Discipleship fills up the pews. That's right. yeah. And so we have to be Jesus-motivated. Jesus-motivated evangelism is not group, but individual Amen. focus. That's right. And so when you look at the message of Jesus, his message was so powerful. Look at all the individual stories in evangelism. Most of the outreach of Jesus was not to groups. It was to individuals. Mm -hmm. The lost sheep, right. the lost coin, the lost yeah. son, That's the right. woman at the well, the man at the pool, the Bethsaida, the demoniac. Yeah. Jesus Mercy. focused on the individual. Yeah. The woman with an issue of blood, blind Bartimaeus. Yeah. Jesus focused on the individual. And so often we get excited when we have crowds, but I remember the story about a pat person who was preaching. I forgot where it was, but the story is nonetheless valid. Uh, he, was, he was in South America in a town where Catholicism was so strong that the priest sent out a letter prohibiting anyone to go to his evangelism. Mm. Mm. <laughs> On the night that the meetings opened, there was not a single person sitting in that church. Mm. He preached for a whole week. He just decided, well, <laughs> nobody here, I'm just going to do. And he opened the well. windows and he preached for a whole week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at the end of the week, he said, you know, this is ridiculous. Nobody's <laughs> showing up. And he heard somebody yeah. outside mm -hmm. in the tree said, keep preaching, we're listening. Oh, All right wow. now. They didn't want the priest <laughs> to let them know that they were in the building, <laughs> yes. but they were hiding in the trees wow. outside of wow. the Good. church. The so we have to be evangelism focused, never Worry about the numbers. There you go. Jesus oh, always takes one waters, Come one on. plants, another waters, but yeah. God gives the increase. Amen. So evangelism is not just the presentation of good message, but the presentation of a good God. Yeah. Romans right. 2 verse 4. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, mm -hmm. forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness, goodness. of God leads mm -hmm. to repentance? And I know, I mean, I've been rebuked in this particular way in my own self because I've become so wrapped up in my early days, mm -hmm. uh, you know, defining the horns and the, and not that any of that is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's so extremely irrelevant, but don't let the horns yeah. eclipse the Christ. Amen. Don't let the beast eclipse the lamb. Yeah. And so that's why Jesus said in John 12, 32, if I am lifted up, I mm -hmm. will draw all people Good. to myself. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and talk about evangelism. How did the evangelism yeah. get started? Mm -hmm. Now, Shelly, you took Matthew chapter 3, so I'm going to leave that, how John the Baptist was a forerunner. But the birth of evangelism is the focus of our story. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 2, verse 3, 34 and 35, the birth of evangelism. You know, John was the forerunner. He had a responsibility. Mm -hmm. His life was short-lived, but his life was fulfilled. The length of a life is not the thing that we should gripe about, mm -hmm. but the fulfillment of our purpose is the major focus. That's right. mm -hmm. John's life was short, but it fulfilled the purpose. Yeah. Let's look at two, two very powerful stories. The, the confirmation of John the Baptist and his mission. Verse 34, then Simeon blessed them. This is now the child being... Uh, Where being, are we? Luke 3? Ver, Luke chapter 2, verse 34. Two, 34. Mm -hmm. okay. Then Simeon blessed them and said, 
to Mary his mother. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, speaking mm -hmm. about Christ, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that is when Jesus oh, is crucified, yeah. that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now let's look at verse 36 and 38. Let's see where public evangelism started. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, mm -hmm. the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, of a great age, and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Yeah. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, mm -hmm. who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Mm -hmm. And coming in that instance, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Public evangelism right. was first proclaimed through a woman. That's right. <laughs> Amen, Shelly and Jim. Well, Praise the Lord. And then it continued. Public evangelism continued through a woman. Yes. John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended. This is Mary in the garden. Uh -huh. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken of these things. And then finally the Lord said, yes. verse Matthew 26, 13, Assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Evangelism publicly began with a woman. Mm. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor All John. Right. We're having church. Okay, we're having church. You're on fire. That's powerful. Yeah. I love that. Right. We got a Wednesday's lesson, which is merciful creator. So turn from the New Testament back to Isaiah chapter 40. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at a few verses there in Isaiah chapter 40. The theme of this passage, Isaiah 40, is the mercy of God, mm -hmm. the power of God, the deliverance of God. Mm -hmm. We see the mercy of God. God wants to save his people because he is mercy merciful. Yeah. The power of God, he's able to save them because he is powerful. Yeah. And the deliverance of God, God is able to deliver them from their enemies, from the gods with a little g of their enemies. We look at the main argument here is that God can do it. He can make the second exodus happen, Amen. which is that deliverance yeah. from the Babylonian captivity. Yeah. He can end the exile. He can defeat the oppressors. He can liberate his people. We see this blending of God's mercy and power. The lesson brought it out. It was really neat before we get into my verses. We see God's mercy in verses one and two. Ryan already covered that. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Cry out to her, her warfare is ended. That is God's mercy. Mm -hmm. We see his deliverance and power in verses three through five that Shelley covered. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, uh -huh. make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We see God's mercy in verse nine, Pastor John, that you read. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Mm -hmm. We see God's deliverance and power in verse 10. Behold, the Lord God comes with a strong hand right. and his arm shall rule for him. We see God's mercy again in verse 11 as he feeds the flock like a shepherd mm. and gathers the lambs with his arms. We see God's deliverance and power in verses 12 all the way through verse 26 mm. as we talk about who this God is and that he is the incomparable creator. That's right. And that it ends with the mercy of God again. The very last verse is verse 27 through 31 of the chapter. As our creator, he gives power to the weak, to the downtrodden, to those who are faint. Mm. He increases their strength. So let's look at who is this God. As we see this, this God, our God, is omnipotent. Verse 12, we're in Isaiah 40, verse 12. Omnipotent just simply means he is all powerful. His power, it's limitless. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Can you imagine the oceans and everything? God just measures it. 
mm. in the hollow of his hand, measured the heaven with a span, mm. and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Oh, the dust of the entire earth just calculated it in a measure. Mm. Weighted the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. What is he saying? God is omnipotent. Right. He is all powerful. God is omniscient. That just means he is all right. knowing. Yeah. The next yeah. verse, verse 13 and 14. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? Hmm. He knows with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Hmm. Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Wow. God knows everything. He is omniscient. He is all knowing. We're the students. We're the ones who learn from him. Yeah. God is sovereign. His authority is absolute. Let's read verses 15 yeah. through 17. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as a small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. Hmm. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor is beast sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are what? Nothing. nothing. They are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. worthless. If you jump down to verse 23, it says, He brings the princes to nothing. Mm -hmm. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Well, huh. What does that say? God's yeah. authority is absolute That's right. over yeah. this entire earth. We see in verses 18 through 20 that he is, Pastor Kenny, without compare. Mm, to whom fair. then will you liken God? We've just gone through this. God is omnipotent and he is omniscient yeah. and he is sovereign and his power is limitless. Yes. Who will you compare God to? The answer is nobody. 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 <laughs> no one compares right. to God. Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image. This is talking about idols. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold or those who do work with their hands. The silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. But who will you liken God to? God yeah. is without compare. Uh -huh. Not only that, not only is God omnipotent and yeah. omniscient and sovereign and without compare, yeah. he is our creator. Let's see right. verse 21 and 22. Have you not known? Oh. Have you not heard? Yes. Has it not yeah. been told you from That's the like, beginning? That's right. Where have you been? Mm -hmm. Where have you not known? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he, that's God, our omnipotent, omniscient God, who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants, they're like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Verse 24, scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth when he will also blow on them and they will wither mm. and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. Mm -hmm. To whom then will you liken me or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Lessons learned in our remaining moments. Uh, wow. Four lessons yeah. that I take away. Look at your problems against the backdrop of your incomparable God, mm -hmm. not the other way around. How often we look at our problems, we put our back to God, well, our God who's omnipotent, our God who's omniscient, our God who's the creator, our God nobody can compare with him yes. and we put our back to him. Yes. And all we do is we focus on the problem and we say, wow, that's huge. But if you turned around and you look at the problem in focus of God behind that problem, mm -hmm. that problem is nothing Amen. in yeah. response to him. That's look true. at your problems yeah. against the backdrop right. of who your God is. Amen. Lesson number two, mm -hmm. change your focus to God yes. instead of complaining about the present. Uh -huh. Isaiah 40 verse 27, jump down to verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my mm. God. Why do we complain about the present? Instead, we should change our focus to God. Mm -hmm. Job did this in Job 19 verse 7. He said, I cry out help, but no one answers me. 
I protest, but there is no justice. Instead of complaining about what is going on in our lives right now, change your focus mm. to God. Lesson number three, mm. our almighty, omnipotent God reaches down to equip, to empower, and to strengthen us. Amen. The God who rules the universe, okay. the God who knows everything, the God who sees everything, yeah. the God who holds this world as like a speck in the palm of his hand. Mm -hmm. He reaches down because he knows we are but dust. He knows our frame and he wants to equip and empower us. Verse 28, have you not known? Mm. Have you not heard? The everlasting mm. God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. His understanding, it is unsearchable. Mm -hmm. Here it comes. He gives power mm. to oh, the yes. weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Yes. You need strength. Do you need might? Do you need victory? Do you need deliverance in your life today? Turn your eyes to your almighty, omnipotent creator, God, who's reaching down just now Amen. and says, I will equip you. I will stand you up. Yeah. I will give you strength. Finally, lesson number four, waiting on God increases your power and strength. Mm -hmm. Verse 30, even the youth shall faint and be weary. Mm. The young men, they're going to fall. But those who wait on the Lord will mm -hmm. renew their strength. God. They will mount up with wings mm. like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They mm. shall walk and not faint. Today, I want to encourage you to turn your attention to your omnipotent Amen. creator, God, your omniscient God who knows and sees Amen. and who can do everything. Amen. And he will lift you up from the dust and set you up and strengthen you for what he's called you to do. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I feel like I've had church. And that's the way we should when we study the Word of God. So that's, that's right. certainly an encouragement from each and every one of you. Thank you. And uh, we need to continue on with uh, Thursday's lesson. And again, all the beauty of building up and lifting up Jesus is, is wonderful. But sometimes we go back to the, it's talking about the problem with idolatry. Thursday's lesson. So there is a problem here that we have to deal with. I see a God in this lesson. I see a God of justice. I see a God of judgment. I see a God of mercy. I'm hearing a God of love and a God of, you know, teachings and rebukes and counsel. But also idolatry ruins our relationship with Christ. So it's something sometimes that we have to, you know, you stick in there among all of this beautiful evangelism and winning souls for Christ and the love of God is wonderful. But we need to realize idolatry because it's prevalent today. And it's in and around and among God's people. It's Thursday's lesson, what is idolatry? I looked in the Diction Webster's and just simply said, to worship of idol, excessive devotion or reverence to some person or thing. Now, notice what, it, what is an idol. An image of something, even of a God, notice this, used as an object of worship, applied to any heathen deity, something given excessive devotion. And certainly we go back, where, where does all this come from? We come back to Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. Notice what the Bible says. Thou shalt not make unto thee what? Any, any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. Verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Here's where it gets in. No, it gets heavy. Nor serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a... Jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Notice this, upon the children and the third and the fourth generation that hate me. Mm -hmm. Now remember, idolatry does what? It destroys our personal relationship or intimate relationship with God that's been established here that we need an intimate relationship with him. Right. By, by idol worship, then we're re trying to replace God with something else. Mm -hmm. The prophet, you know, we talk about, the, refer to idol as spiritual adultery. Mm. This is pretty heavy duty, is it not? Jeremiah 3, 6 through 9, and we'll just kind of hit the highlights of this because of our time. Jeremiah 3, 6 through 9, the Bible says, Thou hast seen that which backsliding Israel hath done. Mm. Remember, we're not just talking about, and I just put this in, we're not just talking about the world and the things that are in the world and what the world is doing. We're talking about daughters of Zion. Mm. We're talking about God's people. 
these things are prevalent among us. We might do all the other things you're saying is wonderful and good, but we have to follow up. We have to get ourselves in line with the Word of God, even in things that's little, maybe distasteful to some, and we don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Notice backsliding Israel. She played, notice that Israel played the harlot. She committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Interesting. Ezekiel comes by, Ezekiel 16, 15 through 19, simply said, put it this way, simply put, God's people played, once again, the harlot. She decked herself, notice this, with colors, with jewels, and with gold, and made images of what? Of men, mm. and didst commit whoredom with them. Well, that sounds heavy duty to me. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 41, 29 says, Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molted images are, notice this, wind of confusion. To worship the, an idol is to break the what? The first commandment. Is that not right? Thou shalt have no other God. gods before me. So if an idol is intended to represent the true God, and let's think back like, let's say the golden calf. You remember that in Exodus 32, 4 and 5? said the Lord rejects it as a likeness of himself. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 19 tells us these verses. Now, don't corrupt yourself. Don't get involved in this by making it graven images. Not, notice it's not of God. Men and women, beasts, the Bible says, or fowl, fish, anything that creepeth upon the ground. This gets pretty personal. We'll get in hopefully a little bit clearer here in, in just a moment. Notice, uh, of the sun or the moon or the stars, don't do any of that kind of stuff. The problem, God says, is be careful that you do not worship mm -hmm. them or you do not what? Serve them, Deuteronomy 4, 19. So what kind of idolatry, we could say, do we face in maybe in our church today? Do, or do we? I think it's a legitimate question. Signs of the Times, 126 in 1882 makes this statement. Many who bear the name of Christians are serving other gods. Besides the Lord, our Creator demands our supreme devotion huh, and our first allegiance. Anything thus trends to abate our love for God or to interfere with His service, do Him. Oh my, notice it becomes therefore an, an idol. It's just, it's just that simple. We know that it's simple, but you know, you have to have milk and then you'll be able to chew on the meat. So we, we got to get to it so we can understand it. That's right. Several forms of idolatry, and then, you know, it could be money, houses, and land, or anything we put before God. We, we've got that. And the um, councils uh, on stewardship, I notice this is 223, just make some statements here, talking about, notice this, demon worship. So we're looking at several things that could be. Demon what? Demon worship is in here. It's very, very important that we look at and say, you know what? We don't want anything to, to do with that at all. Uh, covetousness is a form of what? Of idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about demon worship. We're talking about, you know, we're thinking we're communicating with the dead. We have to be very careful with that. Uh, disregarding the fourth uh, precept of the Decalogue results in and you read that in Prophets and Kings 182. Uh, this gets things people don't want to hear. We, talk about, we, we gamble, we do horse racing and different things like that. It says right here, is a species of fundamental of education, uh, 30, uh, 312. And it goes on to say, much more importance is placed on holidays. Now, when we're entering that season, say, you know, importance of holidays here, fundamental of education says here, we have to be, now remember, it's not said holiday, it said too much importance upon that. Ornaments as a species. That's kind of, you know, think about it. ornaments as a, a species of it. And we're talking about jewelry. We're talking about idols. We're talking, you know, in fact, the Bible talks about jewelry. It talks about, it says it calls it filth. Now, most people don't want to hear that, but I just say, well, we need to hear it because we have to make a decision. If the Bible says it's filth, then it's filth. The Bible says that it's, a, it's an idol, then it's an idol. If it's called a strange God in the Word of God, Isaiah chapter 3, you can look at that for sure, 3 and 4. You can look at it in Jeremiah chapter 4, read it. Hosea chapter 2, verse 13, you can read about it there also. Revelation 17, verse 4, you can read about it there. You can read about it in 1 Timothy, what is it, 2, 9, and 10. You can read it there. You can read it in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 4. I know that's a lot, so I hope you're jotting it down. It has a lot to say about these things. And I'll go a little bit deeper with it because we're talking about, and I'm glad everybody built up and we looked at the name of Jesus, but we're looking at something here, Sunday observance after light has come on the true Sabbath is a form of idolatry, fundamentals of education, 287. Now, quickly, 
picture taking. I hear about a lot about that. Picture taking <laughs> is, a, is a form, is, is a species of, and that's a council of stewardship, uh, message young people, 316. Picture taking is carried to extravagant now here. Length and encourages a species of idolatry. I know anybody don't want to hear that because that's all we do. A lot of time we go around, we're taking pictures, we're letting things, you know, but, but, but. didn't say anything was wrong with that. It's talking about it overdone. Is that okay to say that? That's right. It's, and when it's overdone, it's a species of idolatry. Whether we say that it is or not, God's Word has said it. The Spirit of Prophecy makes it very, very clear. All this means that we are invested in publications, notice this, which would directly direct the souls of Christ and uh, away from Him. We don't want to do that. I know we don't. Our time is running down here, but let's just hit a couple more here real quick because I want you to study these things because it's very important. It'd be nice, Pastor John mentioned a lot of times, it's nice to know about the horns, it's nice to know about the beast, it's nice to know about the mark of the beast, it's nice to know about the image of the beast and all these things here. But if we don't understand this, is it possible we could be lost? Any truth that's in the Word of God once we understand what the Bible has to say about it. Absolutely, it's a testing truth. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Self-dependence is idolatry. Trusting in self for salvation is idolatry. A false concept of God is what? Is idolatry. We worship, if we worship Jehovah or Baal, the living God, or would we worship an idol? Millions know, and we need to know the attributes of God, and we've been learning this on this panel. This quote, quote quickly deals with the second commandment and pictures. Historical sketches of SDA missions. It says, a few condemn pictures urging that they are prohibited by the second commandment. I hear a lot of this going on all the time, but notice what it says here. Is the second commandment prohibits image worship. Example, but, notice this, Ellen White said, but God himself employed pictures and symbols to represent to the prophets lessons which he would have them to give to the people which you know, this could be better understood than if given in any other way. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I want to, I want to balance it. I like to balance it in the Word of God here. Example quickly said the uh, prophetic history presented by Daniel and John. They did it in symbols that we who read might understand it. And I think that's what we need a little bit today. Dig in the Word of God. Mm. Yes. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> Praise the Lord. Got to be careful about them selfies. Got to be, got to watch out for them selfies, right? <laughs> Let's get some final do. thoughts mm-hmm. as, we, as we're preparing to close. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was engrossed. Um, <laughs> I guess that what I just want to think about is God's presence, God's Word mm-hmm. is part of His covenant promises to us. Yes. So, Do your own work. That's repentance, and God will restore it in your Mm -hmm. life. I think the heart of evangelism is Romans 10, verse 14 to 17. I love the way that Paul says it. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Mm. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good Mm. news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, the Lord has believed, who has believed our report. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Mm. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 41, 10, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. God wants to strengthen and help you just now. Amen. <laughs> Quickly, it says our choice will be the same as it was in the days of Israel. For in the end, we always worship something. Mm, praise the Lord. We're going to have to call the fire department. Somebody. Getting hot on this panel. Praise the Lord. We hope that you have jo- enjoyed this study today. I know I have. Uh, yeah. And I can't wait till we mount up like, you know, like <laughs> eagle's wings, right? Amen. And fly off into the comfort of Jesus Christ. We thank you all so much for joining us each and every week. Come back next week. We're going to be diving into lesson number nine. Sure, sure. We'll see you right back here again. God bless. <laughs> <laughs>